I ended the first part of the lecture by giving you the formula for the Rabi, uh, for the Rabi uh, signal, that is called the Rabi oscillation, which describes how a spin pointing up goes down and up again when it is subjected to a resonant radio frequency field. Here, I just show you this in, in a kind of in a graphic way. You see the, the curve which I show here, which is going from zero to one, represents the probability for the spin to flip as a function of time. And you see indeed that at resonance, the spin is going from down to up or up to down and back at, at the frequency omega one, which is proportional to the amplitude of the RF field. So you see, you should, uh, should not confuse the Larmor frequency in the static field, which is omega zero, with the Larmor, with the frequency of the Rabi mutation, which is omega one. You see, when you go out of resonance, you see now that the flipping becomes incomplete. You don't go from one state to the other, you just stop midway and it goes faster. Why is it going faster? Because this frequency increases when you go out of resonance. So you see, when you go out of resonance, the rabbit frequency is faster and smaller in amplitude. And this is just the expression of this. <clears throat> this is just the graphic translation of this general expression. So this is the rabbit oscillation. Uh, you also see that you can, here I have just discussed what happens for SZ, what happens to the component of the spin along the magnet, the, the direction of the static field. But you have also a motion in the plane perpendicular to the static field, which is SX and SY. And what you see is that SX and SY, if you are in the lab, in the laboratory frames are rotating at frequency omega. And so, and you see that this frequency omega is modulate, modulating the, the frequency is modulated by the frequency by the rabbit frequency. So you see that the transverse motion of the spin is uh, evolving at the frequency omega very fast. And at the same time, you have an amplitude modulation, which is related to the rabbit frequency. In other words, the rabbit frequency can be seen as a kind of sideband to the frequency omega. And this is the kind of signal which are detected in magnetic resonance imaging. Because when you put, when you have the spin inside your body, the protons are excited by the radio frequency field. When it is resonant, you have a transverse motion of the, of the spin. And this is the kind of signal which is detected by the antennas which are around your body in the magnetic resonance imaging. And this is, these, are, these are the signals which are transformed by the computer into images of, of your body. On the next slide, I generalize the same formulas in another domain of physics. In fact, you get the same thing if you look at what happens for a two level atom, which has a ground state and an excited state, and you excite it with a laser, which is resonant between the ground and the excited state. It's a two level system. You can express everything with Pauli matrices and if you have the same equation, you have the same physics. And in fact, what you, I described here for magnetic resonance is also true for optical resonance. The only change is that the magnetic moment of the spin is replaced by the electric dipole of the atom between the ground and the excited state. And the magnetic field is replaced by the electric field. So instead of having an emitter which is M dot B, you have an emitter which is E dot D the coupling of the electric field of a wave with electric dipole, instead of coupling the magnetic field of the wave with the magnetic dipole of the spin. But you get the same equations. You have a Rabi frequency, which is now proportional to the electric dipole times the electric field, which I have written here. And uh, the electric field is proportional, evolves in time, like cosine omega t, and you know that when you have a cosine omega t, you can express it as a sum of two exponential which rotate in opposite direction. And one of these components will be important. It's the one which is rotating 
in the spin analogy, which is rotating with the spin, and the other one, which rotates in the opposite direction, has no effect. To neglect the, the other component is called the rotating wave approximation. And once you have done this approximation, you are left with exactly the same Hamiltonian as the one I have discussed before the break, and you find exactly the same Rabi oscillation. So just like what I want you to, to keep from this slide is that the Rabi oscillation, which have started, which has started in the 1930s with magnetic resonance at low frequencies, is also valid when lasers interact with an optical transition. It's exactly the same formula. And this RB oscillation plays a very important role in laser experiment and the kind of experiment we'll be discussing later in these lectures. So now I will describe three diff different pulses of microwave, which play a very important role in magnetic resonance and also in quantum information science, because I remind you that the spin one half is a prototype of a qubit. You, you can the spin up, you can call it zero, spin down, you call it one, and you can entangle bits as I showed you, as I shown you in previous lectures, and you can excite prepare superposition states by using well defined, well uh, uh, tailored pulses. And I will show you three pulses. What is a pi over two pulse? It's a pulse which uh, takes a spin up and makes a pi over two rotation. So it brings the spin up from the Z to the X direction or to the Y direction, depending on where you turn it. And so you, you start from zero, you get this superposition zero and one. And if you start from one, you get the orthogonal superposition. So a pi over two pulse creates a spin in the transverse direction. So once the pulse is finished, what happens? Once the pulse is finished, you have now a spin which is rotating at the frequency omega zero in the X or Y plane. And this pulse radiates, of course, this, this spin radiates electromagnetic waves. It is getting damped, and I will talk about the damping in a moment. So you see that you get what is called the free induction decay. You have a signal, a constant signal, which follows the pi over two pulse which decays with time. And if you have antennas and you have coils which detect it, you detect this signal. And this is typically what magnetic resonance imaging is doing. Uh, when you are in the machine, you hear noises. In fact, the machine is producing pi over two pulses. And after each pulse, you get this decay and this, is this decay which is detected by, by uh, the, the antennas around. So the pi over two pulse prepares spins in a state which radiates a lot because they are rotating in the X or Y plane. Second kind of pulse, if, if the pulse lasts twice as much, omega one t equal to pi, omega one t over two equal to pi, what you get is you go from up to down. So you have completely flipped the spin. And these are uh, the kind of pulse which are used in what uh, you call, we call Rabi spectroscopy. And I will say a few words about that in a moment. Now we have the most intriguing pulse is the two pi pulse. What does a two pi pulse do? It takes a spin up, it brings it down and up again. So you have make a two pi rotation. Classically, nothing has happened. But in fact, as I showed you in the previous lectures, when you rotate a spin by two pi, you change the sign of the wave function. So you, you, you add a, a, a e pi to the i pi uh, complex amplitude. And this is due to the fact that the rotation is EI sigma over two. So next, so what is Rabi spectroscopy? Rabi spectroscopy is just you 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 plan quantum 
y su reparto etc. Scan Delta. Hay 70 Omega. This according to everything the screen has a function of delta, you get this kind of plot. This is just plotting this function as a function of it. And what you find is that you get a red frequency with which is exactly equal to one over This is again a consequence, something which is related to Heisenberg and the relation between time and energy. So you see that we want to wait as long as possible, but we have to make sure that nothing bad happens in during this time. And in fact, we need the time that doesn't. As long as possible to get a But of course, the limit of the light is not as much as possible. So, what we need to do is to do the resolution to get the longest possible time in the After you have to get the resolution, you need to be very, very close. And what you have to do is to satisfy the minimum high time in the range of two to seven. So this is what you get from a pie plot. On the next slide, I am uh, giving you more information about the RAM symmetry. But each of these curves is a pie of the curves. The curves which start. What will happen in the end is that the probability to get to, to flip the spin after this thing, after these two pulses, now will have very narrow fringes. And in fact, distance to interfringe is one over times R. The longer, more time it takes for things to go from one place to the other, the narrower the field. Of course, all this is valid as long as the two pulses are resolute. If the delta becomes too large, then the contrast is the time. In fact, what you can do, what you can show from this formula is that lose the contrast when delta will be equal to be of the order of one over t, which is the time it takes. Yes. 
Thank you. 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 Thank you.
just to demonstrate that, I, I, I have added a few lines here. You see, a density matrix is just a projector. In the case of a pure case, it's a projector on the state. So a D over D T psi psi. And you can, what is D over D T psi? It's one over I H bar H psi bra psi. And then you take the conjugate minus psi and H psi acting on the bra. And this is just a commutator of H with psi psi. So this is just a translation. You translate Schrodinger's equation in the density matrix formalism. You have to compute the commutator of the Hamiltonian with rho. And once you do that, you get, after that, it's a very simple exercise because you know the commutation rules between the sigmas. And you get this equation here, which show you that the Z component PZ, DP, PZ over DT is coupled to P plus and P minus, and DP plus and P minus is coupled to PZ. So you see that you have two coupled equations. The longitudinal block vector is coupled to the, trans, to the transverse one, and reciprocally, the transverse one is coupled to PZ. Up to now, I have not done nothing else than to write again something that I could have written in the wave function formalism because I have not put any relaxation in the problem yet. So what is next? Next is, uh, I can go one step further. I can go in the rotating frame. And so it's what I have done here. You see now that in the rotating frame, there is no longer any time dependence. D, the, D P Z over D T depends only on P plus minus P minus tilde. The, the tilde here means that I am in the rotating frame and D P plus minus tilde is connected to P, P Z. So in the rotating frame, I have equations which are independent of time as it was in the case of the wave function, in the case of the state vector. But now the new, the novelty here is that I will add relaxation. And these are the terms that I have written in red. What is relaxation? Relaxation is a process which, if it acts alone on the system, will bring the system to an equilibrium position. You see what happens for PZ. PZ will go to P0 with a time constant T1. It means that if I, I don't do anything, if my spin is pointing up, it will, the PZ will decrease to an equilibrium value for the spin to be somewhere between plus and minus. In other words, on the block sphere, the system will, the PZ will shrink. And instead of being on the block sphere, the block vector will be inside the block sphere, which means statistical mixture. What will happen to P plus and P minus, they will go to zero because P plus and minus represent the coherence between the spin and up down state. And in case of coupling to an environment, this coherence disappears. So you see that the simplest model to this relaxation is to add two time constants, the time constant T1, which describe the speed at which the information about PZ disappears and T2, which is the time at which the transverse coherence, the transverse uh, spin vanishes due to relaxation. And now I have to solve these equations. And when, when, when in differential equation like that, when you put damping, and these are damping terms, you have a steady state solution, which is obtained by equating to zero, the dpz over dt and dp plus and d minus over dt. There is, the system has a transient and then after some time, it goes to an equilibrium, which is obtained by just expressing the fact that the time dependence disappears. And the steady state is just a solution of equation with zero here. And these are just algebraic equations which have a very well-defined solution. And this is what the solutions that I show on, on the next slide. So this is magnetic resonance what you get in the steady state once you have the transient has disappeared. What I'm describing here is the spin system or the two level system driven by the radio frequency and 
relaxing, submitted to damping. So you have driving and damping, and you get a steady state solution. And you see what happens, PZ minus P0 is given by this function, which looks rather complicated, but it's just a Lorentzian function. You see, it just you have one over omega minus omega naught squared. This is, this is a mismatch, the difference between the frequency and the resonance frequency. And this term just describe a broadening. You see that if omega one is very small, you will have a narrow shape. And if omega one becomes large, you will have a broad shape. This is what I have tried to, to show on the board here. You see, this is the, res the steady state at resonance when, when you have a, a small radio frequency field. If you increase the amplitude of the radio frequency field, you broaden your your line and the line has what is called a Lorentzian shape it's one over omega squared plus uh, one over delta squared plus a, a, a term which describes a bonding so you have a resonance like that and uh, this is for the, the the difference pz minus p0 and you have this expression for p plus and p minus which is the same same kind of curve with a despair with omega minus omega naught plus i over t2. So these are the general expressions. I show them also at exact resonance. If you make delta equals zero, you get this expression at exact resonance. And what you see is that pz minus pz minus p0 reaches an equilibrium value like that and p plus and p minus reach an equilibrium value also that is in steady state you have a difference of population between the plus and minus state which are given by, by this expression and you have a very small transverse uh, moment uh, transverse spin which is given also by this expression what is p0 the parameter p0 describes in fact the difference in population between the plus and the minus state. And if you have, if you are just at thermal equilibrium, if you are thermal, one plus P0 represents the population of the upper, probability to be in the upper state, uh, in the lower state, and one minus P0 is the probability to be in the other state. And the ratio of these quantities is just the Boltzmann factor. And when you solve this equation, you find for h bar omega over kT, small compared to one, you find that P naught is equal to minus H bar omega naught over two KT. So you find that P naught, the, the P zero at equilibrium, P zero is negative, which means that you have more atoms in the lower state than in the upper state. And P zero is very small if the temperature is high. So the, the P zero, which is a factor that you have in all these equations, is very small at high temperatures. This explains the fact that the signal you will get from magnetic resonance will be very small at room temperature, for instance, if the magnetic field is H bar omega naught is small compared to KT. So if you want to have a large signal, you need to have either a huge field or a very small temperature. And when you do MRI in a human body, you cannot cool the people below 37 degrees. So the only solution you have is to have a high field. And this explains why in MRI, you need to have very high magnetic field solenoids, which makes a huge field of several Teslas, because otherwise P0 will be so small that the signal will be too small. You need to have an imbalance between the upper and the lower state, which is large enough to have a good signal. And this is what I express here also. You see also that uh, the quantities that I have written here gives you the power which is absorbed from the radio frequency coils. When you do magnetic resonance, what you try to do is to keep PZ minus P0 in a steady state value, different from what it would be without the radio frequency. And to do that, of course, it costs energy. And the energy it costs given by this formula, it's, it's proportional to P0 and also uh, of this factor, 
factors that you have here. This is the quantity of energy that you have to provide to the system to uh, keep the, the system into a steady state. And of course, this energy is given back by these speeds. And this is the energy that you detect in the coils that you are using uh, to detect uh, magnetic resonance. So you see that in steady state, uh, by definition of a steady state, the, the spins have a constant energy. They take an, some energy from the radio frequency field and they radiate this energy into the coils, into the detection coils. So I, I just give you the formulas, but I don't enter into the details. And you see that if you want to change the sign of the energy exchange between the RF field and the spins, you have to change the sign of P0. And to, sign, to change the sign of P0 means that you mean, need to have more atom in the excited state than in the lower state. And this is called the population inversion. And this is what is required for a maser to, to work. The, the big problem for the maser was to achieve a situation in which you have more excited states than ground state, and then you change the sign of the exchange and you have stimulated emission which overcome absorption. The last uh, uh, equation I will show you here is translating all what I have said up to now in the case of a two-level system, not no longer spins, but an optical transition between an excited state and the ground state. The excited state has a width, natural width gamma, which is the, the reciprocal of the lifetime of the excited state due to spontaneous emission. And I can compute in the same way, the steady state, which is reached when I take relaxation into account, so I just write the same expression as on the previous slide, but now T1 is the time it takes for the atom to go from the upper state to the lower state. That is one of a gamma, where gamma is the width of the state. And T2 is the lifetime of the coherence. But since the ground state does not decay, it is easy to show that T2 is in fact uh, twice, twice as long as T1. The coherence decays twice in a time twice longer than the excited state. And so I have, I, I replace T1 by one over gamma and T2 by two over gamma. And I get this equation here, which I can write in this way. And you find that uh, if you scan the frequency of the laser, you get a Lorentzian shape, which has a width equal to gamma in frequency, which is gamma over two pi. The width is in, in, in unit of omega, it's gamma, and unit of nu, which is omega over two pi, it's gamma over two pi. So this is a natural width of the transition, and you observe it if you, if you scan the frequency of the laser and, and, and let the system get into a steady state. And you see again that you, if you want to have a very good precision, you need to have very small gamma. And it's again a, an expression of the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. Okay, now the last few minutes left, I would like to discuss a point which uh, might be, might have uh, surprised you. Uh, you see what, what I have shown to you today is that if you have a two level system and if you start from one state and if you apply a, a resonant field either in the radio frequency domain or in the optical domain the system will go from one state to the other according to a sign law and if you start a sign law you see that the the probability will increase as t squared because sine square omega t over two so you have an increase of the probability to be in the upper state which increases as t squared and this seems contradictory with the einstein coefficients that I introduced in the first lecture. Uh, what Einstein showed that the probability to leave the initial state or to go from the upper to the lower state is given by a rate equation. And the rate equations is something which at short times varies as t and not as t squared. The probability per unit time to leave the ground state is a probability per unit time. So by definition, it gives a probability which increases linearly with time. 
So what is the difference? Why in one case we have something like T squared and other case something like T? The answer is that the evolution in T squared is valid if you have a coherent uh, field, light field or radio frequency field, which has a well-defined phase and we have, which has no disturbance of the phase for a long time. Uh, in the case of the Einstein coefficients of thermal radiation or a classical light, this is a light which is chaotic, which is which change phase very fast. And this phase changes, the amplitude changes, transform a T square low into a T low. And that's what I, I try to show you here. So you see here, assuming that you have a well-defined monochromatic field evolving over a long time period, and you, comp you want to compute the probability uh, to go from the lower state to the upper state, you get a Rabi oscillation. So it starts like T squared and it's reversible. It goes up and down like that. But what is, how can you describe a classical field, the field from a lamp or from the sun? You can, a very simple model is just to assume that for a very short time, the field is coherent. And then after you have, after some time, you get a phase jump and amplitude jump. You have another piece of, current feeds and a third one and so on. So the light which comes from lamps has a lot of phase changes and amplitude changes. And it's easy to understand why, because all the atoms in the lamp radiate independently. And so very fast, you lose the coherence of the radiation when the, it comes from many atoms emitting independently from each other. And you see that a very important parameter here is what I call tau c, which is the coherence time. It's the time during which you can assume that the field re remembers its phase. And after that, the phase is lost. And according to Fourier transform properties, one of the C is the bandwidth, is the width of the radiation. So you have this parameter C, which is inversely proportional to the spectral width of the light. And the light which comes from classical lamps has a very large bandwidth, several, gigahertz, which means that tau c is a very short time, a time of the order of 10 minus 10, 10 minus 11 seconds. But 10 minus 10, 10 minus 11 seconds, it's a lot of periods. So you still have a train of radiation, which for thousands of periods keeps its phase. And after a few thousand periods, it loses its phase and take another phase. So how does it translate in the problems that I wanted to describe now? What you have to do when you have a classical light is to assume that during time tau c, you have a piece of Rabi oscillation. And then after that time, another Rabi oscillation occurs, but with a completely unrelated phase. So you have to add pieces of Rabi oscillation, which lose the memory of the phase after a time of the order of tau c. And this will give rise to very simple formula, as you will see on the next slide. So, during time tau c, what, what do I have? I have a Rabi oscillation. And since this time is short compared uh, to omega 1, I can expand the sine square and I get this probability proportional to tau c squared. So the Rabi oscillation during a short time gives a probability of going from one state to the other proportional to tau c squared. And then I have to add the contribution of pieces of field which are incoherent with each other. So what if, if I wait during a time t, I will have t over to, the number of, of pieces I will have will be t over tau c, because I have to divide the time t into, into slice, which are tau c. And so you see now that I have to multiply tau c square, which I have here, by t over tau c. And now I have just or dt over tau c, now I have something which is proportional to time and not to the square of the time. Because I take tau c squared multiplied by dt over tau c and one tau c disappears. And I have now a quantity which writes like this. And you see that tau c, the tau c that I have here is just one over delta omega, where delta omega is a bandwidth, the width of the radiation. And now I have found that the dp, the, the change in the probability to be excited is proportional to time with this quantity omega one square over delta omega. 
And what is omega one square of the delta omega? It is the spectral density. It's omega square is intensity uh, divided by by the frequency interval over which the field is uh, distributed. And by definition, this is I omega. It is the spectral density, the amount of energy per time per uh, frequency interval. And so now you see that in by this expression, I recover the quantities which Einstein introduced in his paper. I call on dp over dt is equal to this. And this is just i omega. E square over delta omega with epsilon naught give you the spectral density. And this factor here, which depends only on the electric dipole of the transition, this factor is the Einstein coefficient. And you see that a, a low, a t square low has been transformed into a t low because you add up incoherent evolutions during uh, short time intervals, which add up over longer times. So this is, this is a connection with uh, the Einstein coefficients. Uh, another uh, last point I would like to make here is to show you that you, we can also evaluate the spontaneous emission lifetime by using the same kind of argument. You see, what is spontaneous emission? It is the fact that due to the quantum fluctuations of the field, which I described at the beginning of the lecture, an excited atom falls back to the ground state because its emission is stimulated by the fluctuation of the vacuum. Exactly in the same way as it is stimulated by an applied field, the fact that you have quantum fluctuations that you cannot avoid will stimulate the excited state to radiate to the ground state. And you can compute the order of magnitude. The, the quantity that you have here, this is the spectral density of the vacuum fluctuation. H bar omega over two, this is the intensity of the, the, the energy which is counted in one mode. And you multiply something which is proportional to omega square over C square, which give you the number of mode per unit frequency interval. This is the number of mode per frequency. And you find now that you have a spectral density which is proportional to omega cube. There is one omega, which is the fluctuation of the field in one mode and omega square, which is a number of mode per unit frequency interval. And you take this spectral density and you multiply it by the Einstein coefficient that I showed you on the previous slide. And you find now the rate at which the excited state decays. You get gamma given by this formula. This is just an order of magnitude estimate. The real, the exact result within a factor of the order of unity is given here. This is spontaneous emission of a transition for which you have a matrix element of the electric dipole. It's proportional to the cube of the frequency and to the square of the matrix element of the dipole. And you put all these figures here. So you see that the spontaneous emission can be interpreted as being triggered, as being stimulated by the vacuum fluctuations which surround the atom. I just, on the next slide, I just apply this to the case of hydrogen, which we studied in detail in other lectures. And uh, I, I just, I will not enter into in details, but I will just give you the exact formula and you can compute them if you want. The, the, the dipole, what, is, what I show here is, uh, what is the electric dipole d squared between the ground and the excited state? It's something which is proportional to Q A naught. A naught is a Bohr radius. Q A naught is the, the unit of electric dipole. You multiply that charge by the distance between the nucleus and the electron. So you have this expression. You have some coefficients which come from expression of the wave function. And you find something that you can express in unit of alpha of the fine structure constant. So once you have D square, you have also the frequency of the transition between the 2p and the 1s state. This is just the Rydberg formula. And uh, it can be expressed again in powers of alpha. And then you put that in the formula D square time omega cube. You put all the, the, the coefficients and you get something which gives you now this gamma as a function 
again, you find something which is alpha to the fifth power. You find something which has the same variation with alpha as a lamp shift, which is not surprising because it's also due to the vacuum fluctuations. And when you compute this expression, you find six, 10 minus eight, second minus one. And the reciprocal of this gives you 1.6 nanosecond. So you find the uh, lifetime of the excited of, uh, of hydrogen. Now, uh, I can do the same calculation for other states in hydrogen. And this is what I do on the other part of this slide. I can scale this and find how it varies with n, with a principal quantum number. And uh, this is what I do here. So what you can, you can look at how uh, omega varies when you go up into the energy levels and you compute omega from n to n minus one. It's something which varies as one over n cube. Why? Because uh, the energy level varies as one over n square. And the difference between two levels is a, is a derivative of one over n square, which is one over n cube. So you find that the frequency decreases as one over n cube. And since the life, the, the, the transition probability is the cube of the frequency, you find a n to the nine law. So you see that when you excite atoms and when you look at the radiation between excited states, it becomes slower and slower very, very fast. You have a one over nine low, but the dipole increases, so it goes in the opposite direction. When you put all the figures together, you find that the lifetime varies as the fifth power of n. You find uh, here something which is n minus five, second minus one. And when you put the figures together, you find that if you look at the ball orbit with n equal 100, the electron on this circular orbit radiates with a lifetime of about one second. So it takes, if you were able to excite the atom in the n equal one, 100 state, it will stay there for about one second before decaying. And if you take n equal 50, you find 30 milliseconds. And the reason why I, I uh, mentioned this is that in, in the last lectures, I will be discussing experiments performed with Rydberg atoms, atoms in very excited circular states. And the, typically, the lifetime will be in the 50, in the 30 millisecond range. Last slide before I finish. Uh, I, what I have assumed so far is that the, the system decays by what electric dipole transition, transition which are uh, sensitive to the fact that there is an electric dipole and the matrix element of QR between the ground and the excited state. But you have transitions which are forbidden by, for electric dipole. And what happened next are magnetic dipole transitions. And what I show you here is a ratio between a magnetic dipole and an electric dipole. You see, the magnetic dipole, the product of the magnetic moment Q over 2m time b. And the electric dipole is QA0 time e. And if you look at the ratio of this quantity, you find alpha you find that the magnetic dipole transition has a strength which is alpha time, amplitude is alpha times smaller than for an electric dipole. And then when you take the square of this matrix element, you find alpha squared. So you see that magnetic dipole transition, the transition that you have between spin, when the spin decays from one level to another one, is intrinsically alpha squared times smaller. And you have the same ratio if you take what is called electric quadripole transition. These are transitions which are sensitive to the quadripole distribution of charges times the gradient of electric field. And this is again alpha squared smaller. So when you develop the interaction of the atom with the field, you get a, a series of perturb perturbation theories. The first term is the electric dipole that is the strongest coupling. And then when you go to magnetic coupling, you lose a factor alpha squared. And this explains the orders of magnitude I would show you uh, now on this slide, when you compare, when you, so if you compare a magnetic dipole to an electric dipole transition, you lose alpha square. Alpha square is about 10 to the four. So instead of having one nanosecond, you will have 
tens of microseconds. So electric magnetic dipole transitions have much longer lifetimes. This is for the same frequency. But now if you go to microwaves instead of optics, you lose another omega cube factor. And I, I tell you that because I want to compare the life of uh, hydrogen that I just showed you before avec, with the lifetime of the cesium clock. The cesium clock is a 9.2 gigahertz magnetic dipole between two hyperfrequencies the ground. Lose an alpha squared factor because you go from electric dipole to magnetic dipole and you lose omega cube, the cube of the ratio of nine gigahertz to an optical frequency. And when you put all this together, in fact, you lose something like 10 orders of magnitude, uh, much more than that, 19 orders of magnitude in the lifetime. So instead of one nanosecond, you get something like 10 to the 10 second, which is 300 years. So in the cesium clock, the upper state in the cesium clock has a lifetime of 300 years, which means that it's completely negligible for the description of physics. So what I just this order of magnitude will show you that uh, in magnetic resonance, the spontaneous emission is completely negligible. You have other relaxation processes which are much more important and you can completely neglect spontaneous emission. On the other hand, when you want to build a good clock and I come back to this, uh, what I already said, you need to have a very long lifetime and then you need to have transitions which are forbidden for electric dipole, also forbidden for magnetic dipole, in which the spontaneous emission comes from higher and higher order of the coupling between the atom and the field. So, and now I just conclude on the last slide. So uh, I, I have recalled uh, the, the early history of atomic magnetic resonance and uh, discusses the birth of NMR, MESA, quantum electrodynamics. And I have also described the basic tools of microwave and laser spectroscopy. I have say a few words about Rabi and Ramsey pulses and analyze how you can describe block by block equations, the evolution of the spin or an atomic system submitted to a coherent microwave or to laser light in the presence of relaxation processes. I have spent some time to describe the difference between a coherent excitation giving rise to a reversible Rabi oscillation and the irreversible process in the case of a, of a chaotic classical light. I have given an estimate of the spontaneous emission rates of excited atoms in the case of electric dipole, magnetic dipole, and electric quadrupole transitions. And uh, in the next lecture, I will apply all this to describe the double resonance optical pumping experiments, which are performed with classical light. And I will analyze simple theoretical models of masers and lasers and start to study the properties of laser light and how can they be used, how they can be used to perform quantum leptics experiments, which were out of reach with classical lamps, and especially all the effects called nonlinear optics. The fact that when you have intense light, you get phenomena which were impossible to observe with the light produced by classical uh, lamps. So we'll stop here. Thank you very much.